Welcome to the Goodbye Privacy Podcast. I am your host. My name is James Azar, and I've got an episode for you guys today. I hope you're ready for it because it's the battle of the giants, and they're competing for us, and while they're doing it, they're just tromping our privacy. It's Amazon versus Walmart. But before we get started on today's episode, I want to talk to you guys about CyberHub, CyberHub Engage and Patreon.com. So if you go to patreon.com forward slash CyberHub Engage is where you can support our podcast and help us grow our content. Being a global CyberHub Engage follower means you care about your security and privacy and we care about it too. This is why we're seeking our loyal listeners support. This way we're able to continue to curate content and give you what you're looking for by listening to the CyberHub Engage family of podcasts. And now remember, when you subscribe to patreon.com forward slash CyberHub Engage, you're not just part of Goodbye Privacy, you're also part of our CyberHub Engage flagship podcast where we talk to CISOs. Don't forget, this podcast is hashtag data cartels. Look us up. Make sure you're sharing this with your friends. They need to know all about it. So just make sure you go to patreon.com forward slash cyber hub engage. Again, that's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash cyber hub engage. Support us for as little as $5 a month. Now, let's get to today's episode. Amazon versus Walmart. All right, so here's the thing. Amazon's changed the way we shop and buy, right? And it's been dominating the market. I mean, Cyber Monday was an Amazon invention. Amazon's been putting malls out of business, changing the way retailers develop. They have the largest market share in the online shopping place. But on the other side of the ring of the battle we're looking for today is Walmart. And Walmart's the world's largest retailer. Walmart changed the way we shop with their superstores. Before Walmart, there was no such thing as a superstores. They've also got the low prices, the little smiley face that follows you around in their commercials. But one of the biggest knocks on Walmart, and this is documented across many of industries, is the way they've negotiated with vendors. One could attribute the rise of cheap Chinese manufacturing to Walmart. Walmart, it's been noted, have put factories of TVs and electronics out of business in their pursuit of the lowest price possible to sell us the lowest price possible TV. So they've made cheap electronic goods affordable. Hence, everyone's got a big screen TV and an iPod and a Kindle and all these other things or the mimics of them. I haven't shopped in Walmart for like 10, 15 years now, so couldn't tell you. I am an Amazon shopper, so this one is personal for me. And in doing this research, I was infuriated. Here's the other part of it. Walmart controls all the online foot traffic. In fact, all the uh, domestic foot traffic, like the actual brick and mortar foot traffic, I'm sorry, I did not mean to say online. And what that means is that they pride themselves on being within a few miles of 90% of the US population. But what we don't hear about is how they've been dominating in South America and Mexico, and how they've been expanding rapidly in Asia, doing the same exact things they did here, taking out small mom and shop, mom and pop businesses that supported families for generations and turning them into superstores where they're paying people minimum wage or a bit higher than that to work for Walmart brands. But this war that Amazon and Walmart are heading towards to, this battle path between both companies, what does it mean for our privacy? And why did we here at CyberHub Engage and at Goodbye Privacy decide to do an entire podcast on their retail war. I mean, after all, when these companies compete, it's good for us. We get cheaper stuff, we get better service, because they want our business. And while all of that is absolutely true, there are some things here that impact our privacy. And let's bring this up. Behind the scenes, both of these companies have billions and billions of dollars, and they've started consolidating their competitors, both online and in brick and mortar. They've been acquiring firms and companies. Amazon's been doing it since about 1994, 1999 was really their biggest acquisition. 
not to date, but their biggest acquisition at that time. Walmart is a late bloomer, but because they're a late bloomer, they're spending a lot of money to catch up to Amazon. And Walmart realizes that they got to go after Amazon, and Amazon realizes that Walmart's gunning for them. And so now everyone, they're in a competition to win this battle. And what's it going to look like? So technically speaking, this war is going to lead to a lot of good things for a short period of time. But once each market's been settled and each company's marked its territory, right? This war will become no different than the wireless war a century ago. If you guys remember 10 years ago, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and T-Mobile were at war. And there was a big, big difference in the pricing, right? So Walmart was the cheapest company. Um, sorry, T-Mobile was the cheapest carrier. Sprint had the better coverage of the cheapest carriers. And AT&T and Verizon were like the luxury of wireless. Well, in the online shopping world, it seems like we're heading into a two-man battle. Amazon versus Walmart. So what does that really mean? And what does it mean for us as consumers? Now, in this war, we're not talking about switching every few years like we do with our cell phone carriers. If I'm not happy with Verizon today, I'll go to AT&T tomorrow. And if AT&T doesn't do me any good, I'll go to T-Mobile. And if T-Mobile isn't any good, I'll go to Sprint. Here, we're talking about our entire way that we shop and live and get everything we, 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 we do in our daily lives. And Amazon and Walmart have been working on this for ages. They've been planning and strategically making it so that every part of our lives has to go through them. Now, let's get to this part. Think about the day where Walmart is how you start and go about and close out your day. After all, this is where they want us to go. One app, one app, that gives us everything we need. We don't need another app. We have the Amazon family of apps or the Walmart family of apps, and that's how we get everything. You wanna order lunch? No more going to Chipotle to get your food. You just order it on the Walmart app, and Walmart brings you a Chipotle-style lunch right to your desk, wherever that may be. Amazon's been doing the same exact thing. Now, there's a scary part to that. Let's think about it like this. Anytime you use that app for anything you possibly need, you're being tracked, traced, or otherwise. And while this sounds convenient and great for us consumers, again, in the big picture, you might be asking yourself, why is this bad and why should I care? Now, let's, let's dig in both companies' activities over the last several years as they continue to build their online empires and in another way, dominate our lives in the name of making things better for consumers. To make this point, I want us to review some of the acquisitions both Walmart and Amazon made over the last five years and how it's helped them shape this war. So let's start off with this, and I'm gonna start off with Amazon. Why Amazon? Well, because they start with an A and go all the way to Z. If you've never noticed that on the Amazon logo, you've never paid attention, but the Amazon logo and um, Mike, I don't know if we have the Amazon logo that we can stick it next to me, has an arrow of A to Z, from the A at the very beginning to the Z where it goes on. So A to Z. So Jeff Bezos, the world's richest man, is the ultimate success story. In fact, if you're on LinkedIn and you're an entrepreneur and you're following other entrepreneurs, or just salespeople, <laughs> or really anyone who's trying to start his own business, they look at Jeff Bezos as a role model, someone who started a small company out of, the, out of his garage in his home in 1994 to becoming the world's richest man 25 years later. But how did he turn an online garage, an online bookstore from his garage into an empire? Well, Let's look at their current business model. If you shop on Amazon, like I do, like many of us do, then you're one of the many Americans who no longer visits a mall. And really, even people who go to the mall aren't really shopping at the mall. 
They're taking their kids to the mall because the mall is a safe place to go. You get your kid an ice cream at the mall. You get a cup of coffee at the mall. You walk around. But at the end of the day, when you're shopping in the mall, you've got your phone in your hand and you're on Amazon comparing prices. And if it's cheaper on Amazon, you're ordering it on Amazon. And if you've got Prime, it's there in two days. Right? But Amazon also has Amazon Video. And that's kind of their answer to Netflix. And if you don't have Amazon Video, if you're an Amazon Prime member, it's actually free. It's part of your Amazon Prime membership. So the Amazon Prime membership, $100 a year, now it's going to $120 a year, also gives you Amazon Video, which is their streaming service. You can watch Prime movies and TV shows, exclusive Amazon TV shows. And they've also air NFL games on Thursday nights. So when we look at that, Amazon's video service is free for Prime members. So to complete this service, and here we go, folks, we're going to start in 1998, way before Amazon ever had video. Amazon actually bought IMDb. And if you've heard of IMDb, we've all seen IMDb. If you ever research a movie, you want to know where it was filmed, who's starring in it, how long ago it was made, how much money it made in the box office, we all go to IMDb. And in 1998, they bought IMDb for $55 million. Why? Was it a master plan or was it just an acquisition of a popular website so that they can advertise their books? I'm not really sure. The world's number one... So a year later, in 1999, Amazon bought Alexa Internet for an undisclosed amount of money. This Alexa was all-knowing, like the Alexa we have today in our homes, offices, and other places. Only this Alexa tracked and reported website and online traffic. This was back in 1999. Amazon bought a popular website used until today called Alexa.com. Now, while Amazon has an Alexa product, the voice assistant product, no pun intended, that knows everything, they also have a website that knows everything and can track how many people visit a website, what's the top website per country, the geography of where do people visit this site from, what kind of people visit this site, what's their age groups. How much time do they spend on the website? How many pages does an average user visit? This very site was bought by Amazon and this very company was bought by Amazon in 1999. And between 99 to 2008, Amazon did a lot of acquisitions. Most of it was to build their book business. And really kind of cement themselves as the go-to online store. And if you go to Wikipedia and you search a list of mergers and acquisitions by Amazon, got that right here, folks, print it out. Um, yeah, I did not save on paper, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, this is a very thick piece of paper because they have made a lot of acquisitions, but nothing really noteworthy outside of IMDB and Alexa Internet, which I feel both were major acquisitions as part of their empire today. And over the years from 1999 to um, 2002, from 99 to 2002, they pretty much went through a dice spell where they acquired nothing. In 02, they went back in and acquired Egghead Software. That's a retail company for $6 million. That was really nothing. And then in 04, they really picked back up and started acquiring e-commerce sites. They acquired joyo.com out of China um, for $75 million. That's part of their Amazon China growth plan back in 2004. Uh, Book Surge and a bunch of others. They um, also bought Moby Pocket in 05. Again, most of this activity was around their book business. And in 2008, in January of 08, Amazon uh, bought Audible. And Audible was the way they pretty much cornered the market, the book selling and book acquiring market in 2008, when they acquired Audible, they pretty much got rid of everything and anything that could compete with them in that end. And today, that's why anytime you want to order a book, 
You go to Amazon. You don't go anywhere else. And when they bought Audible.com for $300 million, they've officially dominated it. From 2008 to 2013, Amazon continued to innovate and acquire firms to help grow its dominance in the book and video market by acquiring more companies to create the Kindle and enhance their services to make sure that's how we got our books. So they acquired everything from printing companies to anything else in the middle. And you go, James, what does this have to do with their wall with Walmart? Well, one way to get you to buy something is through books. People still enjoy buying books. God knows I enjoy going with my wife on a Saturday afternoon to Barnes & Noble, grabbing a cup of coffee from the Starbucks inside of there, and looking over their book selection to find the book and actually smell the book before I get it in the mail. But when I want to buy a book, if I'm at Barnes & Noble, chances are I'm pulling up my Amazon to see how much cheaper it is than Amazon. If it's a significant price difference, I'll probably order it from Amazon and leave Barnes & Noble. That's just the way it's done. Um, and that's just the way I've, I'm doing it, right? But that's neither here nor there. In 2004, Amazon shifted their acquisition strategy from books to AWS. AWS stands for Amazon Web Services, where Amazon already recognizing the trend started a massive buying spree of various technology firms from data center technology, data analytics, software, and payment processing. The latter is the most important piece. They started acquiring payment processing firms. Doing that allowed them to control their entire supply chain. Less vendors, more things in-house within Amazon. Finally, this positioned Amazon first and foremost at the top of the internet infrastructure, allowing it to host websites, organizational data, and development environments. Now, that's next week's episode. And next week's episode is all about Amazon Web Services and what does it mean for us consumers. But for today, we're going to have to get back to our war. Up until 2017, Amazon was focused on everything. They built Amazon Web Services. They solidified themselves as the ultimate bookstore. And then something changed in 2017. And if you're a big fan of acquisitions, I'm going to roll old school here and go to June 16th, 2017, when we woke up one morning nearly two years ago and realized that our favorite grocery store on the planet, Whole Foods, was acquired by Amazon for $13.7 billion. Firmly allowing Amazon to cement itself as really your A, to Z solution for anything you need to buy. And right when they bought Whole Foods, what's the first thing Amazon did? Lowered prices by 40%. And you go, James, that's great for us. You're absolutely right. It's great for us. But what does it mean for our privacy? And we're gonna get to that here in just a minute. They started leveraging Whole Foods marketplaces, the actual grocery store, to help deliver groceries to your home within two hours and allowed Whole Foods to become places where you can actually return some Amazon product. Although they've kind of stopped that due to the overwhelming amount of foot traffic that was going into Whole Foods to return stuff and Amazon's kind of spread out its own stores and is using UPS for it at the moment, that's still an option. Finally, this has put Amazon front and center in our lives as a one-stop shop for anything we need. If I want to order food today and I don't feel like leaving my house, I can go on my Amazon app and order food and have it delivered within two hours to my home. I'm talking about an entire grocery list. I'm going to stop here for Amazon for now and I want to move to Walmart. But before we move to Walmart, I want to talk about our next sponsor. CyberHub Summit, it's hosting its Executive Annual Summit in Atlanta, Georgia on September 11th, 2019. CyberHub Summit believes that in order to address the various cybersecurity challenges, we need to change our approach to cybersecurity. Last year, CyberHub Summit hosted over 150 of the top executives in an intimate setting while our participants took part of a live breach simulation, also known as a tabletop exercise. In the crowds were some of the leading CISOs, general counsels, CIOs, and CTOs, all of which left with an understanding of addressing cybersecurity concerns and challenges. This year, 
CyberHub Summit has a day of cybersecurity activities that will blow your mind. Make sure you go to cyberhubsummit.com. Again, that's cyberhubsummit.com. C-Y-B-E-R-H-U-B Summit, S-U-M-M-I-T.com to pre-register. Spaces are very limited for this year's summit and it will sell out quick. So make sure you go now and pre-register so that when they send that first email for tickets on sale, you can get your ticket now. Also, if you're interested in speaking or sponsoring, go to cyberhubsummit.com and apply there to either sponsor the event or speak. Now, back to Walmart. Let's look at Walmart and how they're really arming themselves for this war against Amazon. Walmart, in order to compete with Amazon and realizing that it needs to get a better online presence and change its perception that it sells cheap Chinese products and no-name brands. And it's been transforming over the last few years. We all remember the website, Walmart, people at Walmart, Walmart people, what is it, Micah? Which, which, which site is it? People in Walmart, Walmart people? I think it's people at Walmart. People at Walmart, right? Yeah. Where you see all the kind of really adorable American characters, the best of America at Walmart, only doing what we know best in America, shopping. Walmart, over the last several years, has been trying to transform itself, opening locations in high-end neighborhoods with a better layout and more name brands, doing partnerships with companies like Lords & Taylor, Nordstrom's, and others. Something that wasn't part of Walmart merely decades ago. They did this as part of a plan to incorporate themselves on the same level as Amazon, among Amazon's best clients. But what did Walmart do in the acquisition space to level the playing field with Amazon? Well, for one, Walmart since inception was global and has had market dominance both in South America, Mexico, places where Amazon still struggles, but Amazon is winning here in the U.S., is winning here at home. Walmart knew it needed more. So here we go as to how Walmart started building their online dominance to compete with Amazon. Walmart started acquiring massive online e-commerce websites like Jed.com in 2016. And in that acquisition, Walmart officially declared we're entering the e-commerce space. And this followed other acquisitions like Popular Moose Jaw, Voodoo, Hayneedle, Shoes.com, and Madcloth.com. They also acquired Bonobos and Popular Flipkart, as well as Art.com, among many others, all to help build their online presence and attract shoppers who wouldn't normally consider Walmart as a shopping option. So if you buy from Judd.com, if you buy from Art.com, from any of these websites that I just said, you're really buying from Walmart. Walmart, realizing the stigma around their name, didn't just take these websites and integrate it into Walmart and said, oh, you want to shop there? You got to shop Walmart. They kept them alive and well within their own infrastructure and are using them to spur and increase their online footprint to compete with Amazon. And sooner or later, there's going to be a change here. Last year, Walmart CEO Doug McMillan described Walmart as a technology company. This was during one of their earning calls. Now, this is a drastic shift from what Sam Walton said and described Walmart when he started Walmart in Bentonville, Arkansas, decades ago. During this earning call, CEO McMillan continued to share with shareholders that Walmart partnered with Microsoft for cloud computing and Google for voice-activated shopping. So while... Amazon has kept all of this in-house. They do their own cloud computing through Amazon Web Services, and they do their own voice-activated shopping through their very own Alexa. Walmart, realizing they couldn't catch up to Walmart, went and said, the friend of my enemy, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so they went to Microsoft for cloud computing, and then they took... Google for voice activated shopping using the OK Google Assistant to do just that. In March of 2017, Walmart launched store number eight, and that was a startup incubator to help it develop technologies that can boost its online dominance and help it win its war versus Amazon. And store number eight is an incubator based out of the Bay Area, where Walmart labs have been since around 2011. Walmart Labs is part of the Walmart family that allows it to integrate 
in the Silicon Valley ecosystem to develop and partner with new and up and coming companies to help it win this war against Amazon. Now, imagine Amazon is based in Seattle. So, Walmart realizing that Amazon is strictly based in Seattle with very little Bay Area presence, went to the Bay Area where it's the hotbed of startups and money and had the billions of dollars to invest there to start to find a way to compete with Amazon. Now, did they do this too late? CEO Doug McMillan says, while we started late, we plan to catch up very, very fast. And Walmart does have the financial resources to do just that. Just a few days ago, on April 15th, Walmart acquired Polymorph Labs, an ad tech startup to help, to help it have a more robust and detailed platform for advertisers to target their clients better on their platforms. Walmart also has a very large big data presence that helps it build a more customized shopping experience. Walmart has a very big presence in Silicon Valley. They've been working with many, many companies and they're looking to transform themselves from a grocery store to a technology company. So what does all this mean to us and to our privacy? While both companies are competing for us to have a better shopping experience, they aren't doing this blindly. They're not. Fact is, both of these companies have billions and billions of dollars, and they're investing these billions and billions of dollars in getting our business. And they're obtaining this data that they need in order to segment each and every single one of us and tailor and customize our shopping experience through various methods, some of which we knowingly give them, others of which we unknowingly give them. And that right there lies the problem. I have no problem with Amazon or Walmart trying to customize and show me what I want to see. That is completely different from when Facebook only shows me one viewpoint of a story. When I shop, I want to see what I like to buy. So if I've never bought anything from company A, I don't want to see company A, I want to see company B. I am an Apple and Mac person, have been for the last 15 years of my life. So there's no reason that if I'm on Amazon that I should see anything to do with Windows because I just don't buy any Microsoft or Windows product. I don't. But I do buy Apple products. So I want to see Apple products. And I'm glad that Amazon obtains that information, analyzes that data, and only gives me what I want to see. I appreciate it because it saves me time. It enhances my shopping experience. On the other end, though, the unknowingly way they pick up and process our data to advertise and curtail things to us, I do have a problem with. And I want to challenge Amazon and Walmart to do so responsibly if possible. And I'm not holding high hopes. Both of these companies have been cutthroat in their way to build their empires. They've ran over businesses right and left. They've put people out of business. They've bullied others around with their weight. I don't expect them to do anything different when it comes to our privacy. The unknowingly part is this. As they obtain information on us digitally, Walmart does have one advantage over Amazon, and no one is counting that advantage. Very few people are talking about it. I said it earlier on the show, Walmart brags that it has a store within a few miles of 90% of Americans. Walmart can trace your physical activity and shopping preferences down to the aisle you go to. Now, I want you to think of the consumers that traditionally shop at a Walmart. I'm not stereotyping these consumers, but Walmart does have a stereotypical customer that most of us associate with the brand. If you connect to their free Wi-Fi in their stores, which they encourage you to, in multiple places in a Walmart, free Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi. And when you're from a lower class family, 
with very limited funds and resources, your internet on your phone probably isn't going to be the fastest and you will connect to Wi-Fi in order to continue streaming and doing different things. Fact is, most people use free Wi-Fi. Survey and research has shown free Wi-Fi to be a deliverer of more people into a place than any other thing you can put. People chase free Wi-Fi. Their free Wi-Fi terms and conditions based on the store allows them to trace your movement and time in every single aisle in their store. People unknowingly agree to this. Another part of their terms and conditions also discusses the fact that if you're down their electronics aisle, they can actually show you different electronics ads on your phone because that's where they know where you are. They can curtail it. Now think of their acquisition just a week ago. Polymor Polymorph Labs out of San Francisco. That's exactly what they do. They allow you to curtail and, 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 and build a sort of customized ad environment for your advertisers. So if I sell a product at Walmart, Walmart is saying, hey, we'll geofence everyone that's there and you can advertise to them within our geofencing so that they'll most likely buy your mac and cheese or your toilet paper or your food or your electronics, whatever that may be. Amazon has been for years in bed with some of our social networks. Years. And they've been tracing us online for ages. If you ever buy a book from Amazon and then you log into Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, guess what you'll see in your recommended people to follow? The author of the book you just bought from Amazon. You and I, the innocent, might think, what a coincidence. I just ordered a book. But really, they're tracing your activity right then and there. Alexa, and this is Amazon's big play, smart homes. Amazon is building on the fact that while Walmart says they can trace your shopping and they have a store within uh, miles of 90% of the U.S. population, Amazon beat them to the punch. Amazon Echo and Dot were built as your home assistants, your desk assistants. Alexa, tell me the news. Alexa, what's happening today? Alexa, what's the weather like? Alexa, what time's my flight? Well, Amazon built on that. Fact is, Alexa's listening to everything you say. Alexa's always listening. Being that, there's also been reports of a husband and a wife talking around an, uh, uh, an, Echo, an Amazon Echo or Dot and mentioning something and later it being ordered all by itself. Now, Amazon encourages us to have these Echoes and these Dots all over our house, right? They say, have a dot next to your bed, have a dot in the bathroom, have an echo in the kitchen, have a dot some in your garage, anywhere. You want to live within this whole ecosystem. But what's more troublesome is one of the latest acquisitions that Amazon did. We all know Ring Doorbell. Shaquille O'Neal's their spokesperson. I have a Ring Doorbell. Amazon acquired Ring. Now you think, why would Amazon acquire a home security company that's also a smart home? Well, think of it like this. Ring gives, gives Amazon essentially access to every ring on our doorbell, every movement in our front door, and every time our garage light and our back porch light goes on. Now they can use this very data from Ring to actually do some internal surveillance of their own. So if a driver reports that he dropped a package off at my house at 2 o'clock and I have a ring doorbell. Amazon can actually go into the ring doorbell and check whether or not he really left the package at 2 o'clock or whether it was 1.30 or whether it was 2.30 or 3 o'clock. Is the driver staying authentic? Is he really telling the truth? And that, folks, is how Amazon is taking advantage and building their infrastructure like they did with Amazon Web Services in our personal lives. 
Again, that's next week's episode. Make sure you tune in. Now, Walmart is working hard to catch up to Amazon, and it's spending money and developing and developing new ways to appeal to new users. And to do that, they need data. Remember that in episode one, we discussed how terms and conditions are allowing these companies to share our information with any third party they work with, regardless of who it is and what they want to use it for. And as famous as one small step for mankind, one, giant, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, Neil Armstrong, many, many years ago when he landed on the moon, the famous line of our generation is Mark Zuckerberg telling a senator, Senator, we sell ads. <laughs> but they also work with big companies like Walmart and Amazon because those companies spend hundreds of millions of dollars advertising on Facebook. And part of that advertising is to get data so they can customize their ads better, planning cookies, realizing your viewing habits. What are you following on Facebook? What are you looking at on Instagram? What are you talking about on WhatsApp? And so much more. And when you spend hundreds of millions of dollars with someone, you expect the kind of access that someone else who spends a thousand dollars doesn't get and they get it folks it's there so now that i've given you kind of the breakdown of this war and where these two companies are heading what can we hope for what can we do as privacy advocates what can we do against these data cartels hashtag data cartels so what can we hope for so our best hope unfortunately lies at the u.s capitol the swamp, Washington, D.C., and our legislator. We hope that they can come up with the right legislation to protect our privacy and limit how our data is shared, used, and processed. Now, there's a way to do this, folks. I'm not saying I'm against these companies having our data. I'm saying I'm against these companies having our data not telling us how they use it, pretending like they're using it for one thing while you're using it for so much more, and then hiding behind a very, very long terms and conditions that doesn't understand. Now, Congressman Katko launched a privacy bill. We'll talk about that not in the next episode, the episode thereafter of the Katko privacy bill and what does it really mean. But why can't these companies do focus groups? After all, that's how it was done before. And no one had a problem giving answers and opinions in a focus group. You're getting paid 25, 30 bucks to give your $50, $100 to give your opinion. So if you want to use my data, I'm fine with it. But pay me for it. Today, we're giving it for free. And these companies aren't going to start paying for something that they're getting for free just like that they're just not that nice we need a legislation that's not only going to protect our privacy but also compensate us and i want to talk we'll talk about that in one of our future episodes as the democratic presidential primary there's one guy who keeps coming up with the thousand dollars a month um i think he was on on, on joe rogan and a few other podcasts uh, michael what's his name the uh um y- yang Is yang that right andrew andy yang right yeah he's with the yang gang He's with the gang gang. Yeah, that's right. So he's talking about $1,000 a month to supplement American income for jobs that are going to go into automation and others. We should also be looking at how do we get paid for our data? How does our data and our habits supplement our income when more automation and automation comes through? How do we do that? Where does that come? And that needs to originate on the hill. Walmart and Amazon will do anything they can to gain an edge in their war against each other. And while in one way we may have some short of some sort of short-term wins in this war, that won't be the case for our privacy and information. Imagine this following scenario. And this is where I want to end this episode. One of our Walmart and, and Walgreens and a lot of these companies' big argument around obtaining data and having data and processing data is healthcare a big big topic also big part of the conversation in the democratic uh and and probably in the upcoming presidential election next year healthcare seems to be front and center while we have the affordable health care act 
our healthcare really still is in shambles. It's still very expensive. Many Americans still can't afford healthcare. In fact is nothing's really changed outside of now having a mandate to buy healthcare. And if you don't buy healthcare, you're kind of screwed. But imagine this, all this data now are shopping habits, our buying habits, the food we eat becomes a database that your potential employer in the future can access. And they can decide whether or not to hire you just based on that data alone. So if you're a conservative looking to go work for Twitter and you don't express your political beliefs and you're qualified for the job, what if the hiring manager in Twitter accessed this information and realized, well, this guy orders conservative books, he has a very conservative lifestyle and fits within a conservative category, and you lose your job because of that. You don't get hired because of that, because you don't fit the mold of that company. Nothing to do with your qualifications, nothing to do with whether or not you're the right person for the job everything to do with the fact of your shopping background and what you're buying online. Or worse, in the name of healthcare, they're talking about pharmaceuticals, being able to refill prescriptions quicker, faster, making sure that the sick people get what they need right away. And all that's great, but what are they doing to protect that data? What happens if I know that a specific person of influence somewhere gets his pills every 60 days. And what if I'm able to intercept and ship him something that he's expecting one day, a day earlier, and having him take a pill that could kill him? What kind of accountability or liability would that be for Amazon, Walmart, or anyone else? Both of those companies are making a straight dash into healthcare, trying to address some of the healthcare challenges, realizing the amount of money that lies in healthcare in the upcoming century or two. So what happens as they collect and obtain all this data and someone gets access to this data? And let's say you're a former president and you're ordering your prescriptions off of Amazon or Walmart or Walgreens or anyone else. And I'm an adversary country and I've been able to access and realize your delivery schedule and now I pack a box, I mark it just like it came from them, and I ship it directly to your home. And no one would think nothing of it. You would take that pill, you would swallow it, and only moments later, you will collapse and die. As these companies collect data, how reckless are they with this data? We've seen from previous breaches like Marriott, Equifax, and others. They have a ton of our data. And while these companies are victims of a crime, do we really want to give them a free reign and check to collect and obtain this data and use it for any purpose whatsoever without having some sort of congressional accountability? One could argue that proper legis legislation in the Hill might motivate these organizations to collect less data or secure the data better that they collect. And while a CISO's job is very, very difficult, a CISO is under-resourced. Fact is, if you watch our CyberHub Engage podcast, the one, common, one of the main common things we hear about is we don't get enough face time with leadership, we don't get enough money to address our problems, and we have to do things in a way where we're now reporting and we're auditing the person that we report to. Most chief information security officers report to chief information officers. So you're supposed to secure information, but you're reporting to the person that's in charge of how this information is laid out. That's like the horse riding the caddy, rather than the caddy riding the horse. Is that right? Is it a caddy? It sounds right. I've never heard that that phrase. I think caddies in golf. Who who rides a horse? Oh, yeah, the caddies to golf. It's the uh, the guys the, who do polo. The guys who no no the guys who ride like the horse racing dudes. Whatever they are, <laughs> you guys remember. get this. I'm I'm I'm. I'm 
that was the example that came to my head. I'm not sure about the last example. I don't know if it's called a caddy or a horse or whatever. But I will say this. Corporate structure at the moment, obtaining, looking at security, isn't where it needs to be. And very few corporations act responsibly to things before a law comes down and enforce, forces them to do so. And while I don't know what that law should read, I know that that discussion needs to be had. So we need to start that discussion. Hashtagging this under data cartels on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter, James underscore Azar1. Let's have a conversation about what do we need to do to hold these companies to a level where they can not only protect our data, but also be held accountable if they recklessly don't do so. Or what kind of data are they collecting? GDPR is just the beginning. GDPR was a conversation starter in Europe. The flaws in GDPR are starting to pop up right now. There are lawyers making millions and millions of dollars helping companies circumvent some GDPR law. How do we create not a foolproof law, because I don't think that's ever possible, but how do we protect our privacy, ourselves, against these companies. For years, we've waged war against the government to protect our privacy. And while we focused on the government, we've been losing these battles to money-hungry corporations that are using it to make a buck. It's time that stops. Next time on Goodbye Privacy, Amazon. Everything starts at A and ends at Z. Make sure you subscribe, follow us on Twitter, make sure you subscribe for our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcast. Make sure you follow us on YouTube at CyberHub Engage. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. My name is James Azar. This is Goodbye Privacy.